It is so true that in Christ Jesus we have freedom, and that is the definition of liberty. Man, today, uh, in this very moment, um, I believe that God is going to give us a word for every individual in this room. That's the power of God's word, that, that uh, Pastor Matt in just a minute is going to open up God's word. He's going to say the same thing over 15,000 people. And from our president all the way down to people on staff, all the way down to a senior who's about to get their cap and gown, all the way down to a freshman, all the way down from someone who came from halfway across the world today to check us out in Seafall, I I believe that that word is going to have a very personal and intimate application point for you. And um, we're just honored to have Pastor Matt Chandler with us today. Matt and and his beautiful wife Lauren as well is here. Can we just uh, thank her? for coming, and by the way, the Shanes brought their wives. Bethany is here, and um, Bethany Dillon is in the house, by the way. She's here. She's married to one of the Shanes, and then um, uh, Kelly Everett is here as well. But um, just real quick, I wanted to say a few things about uh, our distinguished guest today. Uh, He probably is uh, the most downloaded iTunes listened to pastor for your generation. You know that already. Uh, Not just your generation, but honestly, my generation. I I can't tell you how many times I've had to come off the treadmill, or I've had to pull the car to the side of the road. Pastor Matt, just to, just to process uh, the Holy Spirit just coming in in my car as I'm listening to you, just expositionally open up God's Word. And so we, we feel indebted to really uh, one of God's great communicators on this planet. But even though Matt can preach, and you'll see that in just a second if you've never sat under his teaching, uh, his loudest sermon was actually preached without a whole lot of words uh, when the Lord ordained and, and blessed him with cancer. And a few years ago, we, we all watched as he suffered well. We all watched as he said, God, no matter what, I, I'm set free despite the circumstances. And, and in that moment, we just watched someone uh, walk into an opportunity to make much of God when a whole lot of people the, would get hijacked by the circumstances. Matt, his family, his children just loved the Lord and trusted God. And in that, there's also been the physical healing. But um, we're just grateful that, that God has allowed him to just have a, a window into the life of so many people who, who just see something go wrong in their life and they lie or they buy the lie that um, that, that God has taken their hand off of them, or that God would have nothing to do with that, when sometimes God just uses something like that just to wake you up, and and it's a blessing and not a curse. And so, and we've watched that with Matt's life, and again, uh, without any further ado, can we just uh, put our hands together, glorify God by honoring his preacher for the moment, Matt Chandler, everybody. Appreciate you. So just right out of the gate, let me be honest that I don't know David Nasser well at all. He is not a great friend of mine, but, but I like what I've seen so far. So I'll, I'll just say I like what I've seen so far, but it's very limited. So uh, maybe I'll be the first one to say that in Liberty Combo history. So uh, it's been a decade since I've been here, uh, and, and I'm excited to be back. And, and I'm excited to be back not just because it's, it's cool to be at Liberty, but because I earnestly and honestly believe um, that, that my own journey, my own story, my own testimony in regards to the person and work of Jesus Christ can invade this space in a unique way. And, and here Here's what I mean by that. Uh, what I mean by that is, is I was powerfully converted by Jesus Christ right before my 18th birthday, and I wigged out. I mean, I went from partying with my friends to having a t-shirt that said, I heart Jesus, and, and showed back up, and no longer would hit that party scene, but would just hand out tracks and share the gospel with anybody who would listen, and I was head I mean, head over heels in love with Jesus Christ, felt rescued and ransomed, knew I was. And, and then I um, graduated and, and worked a little bit, and then I went off to college. I went off to a um, Christian school, and it was at that Christian school that I began to see myself no longer being transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, compelled by the love of Christ for me, but rather being conformed to a standard of behavior that was being predicated or placed upon me, really in an environment where moralism took priority 
over a deep and abiding relationship with Jesus Christ. And that, that's my story. That had to be ransomed and rescued and reminded out of a type of moralistic deism that would steal from me a gladness in Jesus Christ and would replace it with a checklist mentality that would have me listening to the right music and going to the right movies and not saying the wrong words and not drinking the wrong drinks and not doing this and not going here and not doing, and, and robbing me of the very life fuel of loving and earnestly and seriously following Jesus Christ. And so I know when I come to a, a place like Liberty, as awesome as you are, and you hear how awesome you are all the time, all right, as awesome as you are, I, I want to step into the space and just in my, I can just imagine, in fact, I would argue with anyone who would try to say to me, there's no possible way that here at Liberty, moralistic deism isn't a consistent pressure on us to conform to a pattern of religion rather than to be earnestly and zealously in love with Jesus Christ. And so that's the space I want to step into, because here, here's my guess. Uh, some of you, man, you're struggling bad, and this doesn't, this probably in a place that you get to struggle. So you got to hide, right? You got to put on the veneer. You got to be all right all the time. How are you? Praise his name. I'm great. <laughs> really? Because I think, I thought stuff was real tough at home. Oh gosh, no, man. The Lord's sovereign, bro. I ain't worried about that. <laughs> right? You got to just hide it all behind this veneer of perfection and being all put together. So I want to kind of step into that space and call it what it is, evil. Hebrews chapter 12, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab that turn there. If you just have your device, do that. If you don't have your scripture with you, I'll guess that you have it hidden in your heart since this is liberty. So um, <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 1, um, here's what the text says. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, and I'm just going to stop, so if you know my style, I'm going to read, we'll read a little bit, talk a little bit, read a little bit, talk a bit. So we read a little bit, now let's talk. So um, just speaking of how to read the Word of God, when you see the word therefore, kind of a kitschy, goofy way to think about that word is it's there because um, God is trying to remind you of something He said earlier that now is important for what He's about to say again. So the question is, what's the therefore, therefore, right? Kind of goofy, preschooly, maybe junior and high schoolish, but it works in regards to how to read the Bible. And so when he's talking about this great cloud of witnesses, he's referencing back to Hebrews chapter 11 on what's called the roll call of faith, which is really the entire chapter of Hebrews 11, but I'm just going to pick it up in verse 32. And so um, this is spectacular and extremely important for all that we're about to say. And what more shall I say, this is Hebrews 11:32. for time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms. I'm in. If following Jesus lets me conquer some kingdoms, that's man stuff right there. I'm in. Right? Who conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight, women received back their dead by resurrection, period. Now, if the scriptures just stopped there, if that's all that was there, if therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and we go, Okay, what does that look like? And we look back, and here's what it looks like. You escape fire. You shut the mouths of lions. When the army comes, you break that army. You release those who are oppressed. You, I mean, this whole list of amazing—if it just stopped there, I'm going to just say it. Feel free to email me, all right? I couldn't trust the Bible. If it just stopped there, I couldn't, because that certainly has not been my story. Post-Christian, post-conversion. Um, now, uh, there have been times where I've quenched the fire, but I've also been burned a couple of times. See, if that text doesn't continue, and all the roll call of faith is, is if you give your life to Christ, it's going to be rainbows and Skittles. Taste it. Taste the rainbow. Right? If that's all there is, then I've got problems. I've got problems because I live in a world, I pastor a church in which I've had to bury babies. 
I've had to watch young moms get destroyed and decimated by cancer. I had to step into a situation earlier this year where one of our covenant members went down in a private plane crash, and I had to show up at the house at like 7, 8 a.m. while six children got out of bed and came downstairs so that Pastor Matt and mom could say, Dad's never coming home again. Like, if that's all there is, rainbows and Skittles, then I can't trust this God because He has not lined up His sacred authoritative Word with reality. But praise His name, the text doesn't stop there. Now this is the part that nobody really wants to talk about, but it's so dumb because this is the part that we actually live in. Verse 35, women received back their dead by resurrection. No but, no then, not and, it just period, and then some were tortured. That, that's a weird, like, like that's a strange kind of, some received back resurrection from the dead. Some were tortured. It's like a Quentin Tarantino movie, man. It just is, it's, it's odd. Here we go. <laughs> some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in the skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. So when he says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, he's pointing back to this. Success looks different in the eyes of God than it does in the eyes of man. And so he's kind of invading our space here and saying, be careful how you define success. Be careful how you define success, because according to God, a life of faith can be marked by shutting the mouths of lions, but also being destitute and wandering about in goat skins, and, right? And, and not goat skins like GQ. I'm sure Carl Lentz was probably wearing some goat skins when that dude was here uh, a couple of days ago, but not kind of a fashionable, oh, that's amazing, but rather destitute, living in caves. And the Bible says, man, you can be all busted up, look like you're losing at every angle, and that's actually a win. In fact, Romans 1 would argue that one of the ways God reveals His wrath is by letting people chase what they want over and above Himself. So if you're like, I, I just want money, one of the marks of God's wrath is oftentimes going, hey, go get some money then. And then they, they make a million dollars, you're like, gosh, they're so successful. And yet what you're looking at is the outpouring of God's wrath on a man's life. Oh, they're so beautiful, and what you're looking at is an outpouring of God's wrath on a life. Now, we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Be careful how you judge your life. Success and failure is not marked by external realities, but rather a hope-filled faith, step-by-step -step obedience to Jesus Christ. So, he, he says here, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely. Now, I, I like that he did this because, again, I love this text so much because it's rooted in reality. So he, he says there's two things that we've got to fight, all right? We've got to fight um, weight and sin, so I, so I would call it um, fuel and fire. So sin is a, a fire that burns, and, and that, that's, it's unmistakably, unarguably biblical to seriously fight against that sin. But in Hebrews, the author and the Holy Spirit wants us to know this. You also must take very seriously what fuels that fire. Not just the fire, but the fuel. And, and so in your life, whatever sin you battle with, whatever parts of your flesh are, are not as sanctified as maybe the other parts, there are things that feed into that fire. And this text is saying not only do you have to be serious about putting sin to death, but you also have to be serious about guarding against those things that fuel into that fire. Now here's where that's difficult. Most of the time, those things are not explicitly sinful in the Bible, but this is a wisdom issue here. It leads you into what what is sinful. And so I'll, I'll give um, this example. Um, I was 
preaching a series at the village called Beautiful Design, and, and in it I had to do this sermon on women, which is just terrifying. Um, and, and so I, I gathered all the sharpest female minds I knew, and we sat down. I was trying to create categories that, that I could kind of put sins in that, that women struggle with, um, you know, by and large, in a different way that men struggle with sin. And, um, and so we, we, I mean, just universally agreed that the kind of the two big places is comparison. Uh, that, that'd be the first one. They, they really tend to compare. Women compare differently than men. A uh, man will look at himself in the mirror, just nasty gut giant zit on his forehead and be like, you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> but women, women are like, oh my gosh, look at that. Look, no, right there. No, that freckle. Oh my God. Right? So uh, it, it doesn't, so we, they compare differently. And so here's what I'm saying. There, there's no scripture, nothing in the Bible that would say to you, Instagram is sinful. But if you struggle with comparison and your life and your day is fueled with scrolling through Instagram and looking at how awesome everyone else's life is, you're fueling a sin in you that ends with you mocking and making accusation against God. Because nobody posts pictures on Instagram of their nasty days. Nobody's like, like taking a selfie as they vomit with the flu. <laughs> Hashtag YOLO. I mean, they, they're not doing that, right? It's always awesome. It's all, you, you're just gramming things that are awesome, not bad. So then you're looking at other people's highlight reels and you're starting to grow a little bit jealous, a little bit frustrated. And then you get angry that you don't have because you deserve. Why do they get all that? And next thing you know, you're making accusations against God. They didn't care for you. They didn't love you. They, so, so I'm not saying Instagram is sinful. I'm just saying if you struggle with comparison, you're probably foolish for living on it. That's right. That, that's a relationship. There are some people, drunks make terrible bartenders. Maybe that'll work. Right? You, you, you've got to watch what fuels, you've got to pay attention to not only your sin, but what fuels it. And you've got to take it seriously because the Bible here says, since you've been surrounded by all this evidence that God works and that the gospel is true, that he sustains those who lose everything and he's with those who conquer, he, he gets credit for shutting the mouths of lions and he's there with those who don't. Since you're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, take your sin seriously. For whatever reason, and, and I think I understand the reasons culturally, we're, we're trying to give the God of the Bible a makeover right now, right? We're just trying to get him, he's a little bit, he doesn't have a good style, he's still wearing that first century robe that's so first century, we got to catch him up a little bit. And, and we're actually trying to write out of our vernacular and the way we understand our God, his real and present wrath and rage against sin. We really are. We, we just kind of want to make him a, a love fairy in the sky that just, uh, he never gets upset about anything, right? He just, the happy dust on everyone. Just never frustrated, never angry. He is a God of love. Now, here's where I'm going to plead with you to actually think and to exercise that beautiful liberty education you're getting. If there is no wrath, there is a very low level of love. Where love is exponential, wrath will be present. Here's, here's my quick illustration. If you would ask me um, 12 years ago if I could kill a man with my hands, I would have probably said, ah, well, bro, you need to back off that espresso. What kind of question is that? No, I wouldn't kill a man with my hands. All it took was my wife to give birth to Audrey, our firstborn, and for those nurses to lay that little girl in my hands. And I literally thought, oh, I'll kill a brother, I'll rip a brother's throat out. <laughs> like not shoot at him from 150 yards, like watch the life leave his body, right? I could do that. <laughs> now what happened? What happened is the amount of love that I felt skyrocketed, and because the amount of love that I experienced skyrocketed, wrath became present. So that you want to try to harm my daughter, I've got no problem losing my pastoral ministry and having a prison ministry. <laughs> None at all. I'll just go Apostle Paul down in the dungeon. Let's go Apostle Paul in the dungeon. And so I'm telling you, this God's wrath is serious, that there is a day coming where Jesus comes not as a baby, but as the reigning king of glory. And the Bible says that will be such a terrifying day that men will try to flee to the mountains, but mountains will flee before the coming of the Lord. Like, what do you got to do to scare a mountain, man? 
Like the mountain's like, go, go, go! I mean, what, what do you, how terrifying are you that the mountains flee before you? And the Bible says that there's a sword that comes out of Jesus' mouth and the streets run with blood. That's what occurs at the coming of Jesus. You want to know the seriousness of sin? Look only to the cross of Christ and the reality of hell. God is serious about your sins, even those little petty ones that you don't think are such a big deal. See, nobody thinks their sins are big deals. We're like those morons that swim with sharks after they chum the water. Have you seen this? You, you, anybody watch Shark Week here? Do they let you watch Shark Week here? <laughs> I'm just asking questions. I don't know, all right? So, Shark Week, right? There's always a guy in Shark Week, and he's like, well, you got to chum the waters with blood and guts, and then they'll come and we'll swim with them. You're like, why are you getting in the water with sharks? They're going to eat you. They won't. I've got this suit. That suit is made of salt and pepper, bro. They're going to eat you. And then every year, there's at least one where a guy gets bit because sharks do that. And you, when you're piddling around with your sin, you think you're the one guy that's going to swim with sharks and not get bit, not lose your leg, not lose your arm, not watch the waters turn red. No, sin is serious. You're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Throw off the weight. Kill the sin. You don't make a pet of sin. Now, here's what's great. I haven't said anything that you don't already know. Right? I, mean, I just know that. I know who's stood in this little round octagon looking thing here. I, I know that sin is not like, yeah, I know no one in this room's going, what? We're not supposed to sin? David, you serious? Where you been, bro? Been here all semester. This is the first time I'm hearing this. So you know, I know, we know we're supposed to, but, but quick poll. Um, how many of you on throwing off the weight and putting sin to death would give yourself an A++++? Like, I'm nailing, I'm killing all my sin. I ain't struggling. Anybody want to go? Uh, how about anybody making a D? Anybody got a G? Like, not even, I'm not a skip F, all right? Just give yourself a G, all right? Anybody need to redo this semester, if you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, so we know, so what is it that keeps us from being serious about putting these things to death? What is it that leads us into a life where we go, God, I hate that, I never want to do that again, only to do it again. Oh, I don't want to do that, only to do it again. Ah, I'm going to stop that, only to start again. Uh, what is it? Well, thank you. thankfully, the Bible isn't going to leave us stranded on this throw off the weight and put the sin to death, right? He's going to tell us how. So here's how. Look at the next line. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. So, so I love this. This is all about eye placement. Okay, so if you're struggling with sin and if you're wrestling with your flesh and throwing off weight and putting sin to death feels impossible, here's what I would wager. I'd take all that I have, which isn't considerable, and I'd push it in and bet on this, that you are far too busy looking at you and being consumed with you and wrestling with you than you are fixing your eyes on Jesus Christ. So that's what happens, man. You, you become what I like to call navel gazers. And here's where I think this self-esteem movement betrayed you. So I want to try to lovingly tell you the truth. You're not awesome. You're just not. You're not as awesome as you think. You're not as great. And I know you were the guy in your youth group that did all the sketches and played the guitar and led worship, and you were the girl that all the other girls wanted to be and, and all of that. But I'm telling you that every righteous act in your life is but a filthy rag before God. And so the reason, the reason this keeps failing is you're like, gosh, I stink. I stink. I'm not going to stink anymore. Oh, gosh, I'm stinking again. I stink. You're like, get your eyes up. You do fail. You're never going to get this right. So someone who did get it right came for you. See, the message of the gospel isn't that you get to clean yourself up. The message of the gospel is someone has cleaned you up and has now provided for you a righteousness that's greater than yours. In fact, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount was like, you're never going to be righteous enough. He told the Pharisees, who, who had a far more strict code they have to sign off on than you did, that, that unless our righteousness superseded theirs, we would never have any part in the kingdom of God. Those dudes tithe on the stuff in their cupboard. Mint and dill. There were only so many steps they would take on the Lord's day. I'm guessing they're just a little tighter than you are. And Jesus is going to gonna have to do better than that. And what was his point? His point wasn't that we would be able to do better than that, but rather he was better than that. 
And I'm telling you, you chain and shackle and enslave yourself the more you stare at you and the more you make promises to do it this time. You're not. You get your eyes up. You fix your eyes on Jesus. Why? Because He is the author and the perfecter of our faith. He's the author. So this is where I think good theology is so important. So I'll say it and let somebody else deal with the fallout. God saved you. That wasn't, that wasn't you, brother, all right, sister? That wasn't you going, I think I'll get saved. That was the Holy Spirit of God opening up your heart to belief. That's incredible. As goofy as you are, as wonky and weird, that God be like, my team, picking that one. Holy Ghost is like, oh man, I, I'm just, you sure? Jesus like, I got this. Right? He, he steps in and he rescues us. Now think about it. He's my author. Look, I didn't want him. I was a political science major, man. I'm going to be a lawyer, make crazy bank, get a wife, maybe two, unregenerate, don't judge me. All right, big house, lots of cars. I was going in. I can argue. And I remember almost everything I read. I, I could be a lawyer. I could, you can't handle the truth. I was in. <laughs> and so I'm studying and reading. I'm going to be the lawyer of all lawyers. Who knows? Maybe even roll all the way up to some of the highest seats in the land. And God was like, oh man, that's cute. <laughs> I love you. You really are. You're pretty sharp for a finite, here for a couple of seconds in the span of eternity type way. But here's what I'm going to do. All, all these natural gifts that I sewed into your mama's womb in you, I knitted you in there. I'm going to take those now. I'm going to redeem them. I'm going to turn your affection with laser-like focus on me. And, and you're not going to be rich, and you're not going to have a couple wives, but you're going to be happier than you can imagine. Now, come on. And he's my author. So my script was law and millions. That was my script. And God was like, that, that's cute, but I got another plan for you, brother. Preacher. Preacher? They look weird in jeans, Father. No, I got you. I'll take care of that. Come on. Author, but then watch this. He's my perfecter. My, my perfecter. All right, now here's what that means. Let's talk. If Jesus is my perfecter, that means right now I am not perfect, which means I should not be pretending or hiding behind a veneer that says that I am because Christ has already outed me in the cross. Christ publicly portrayed as crucified is God publicly saying, you all need help, you're all going to need me, you're all going to need to bow down, you're all going to need to constantly rest, wrestle with your flesh and having an ongoing ethic of confession and repentance. You will always, always, always need me. I am your perfecter. And here's what's hard for us. We've probably got a list of ways we want him to perfect us. Here's how I'd like to be sanctified, Father. I like a really hot spouse. And then I want my kids to just be obedient. And then I would like things to be really easy for me. And again, God's like, ah, I hear you. Those are good things to want. I created hotness. <laughs> However, brother, I love you too much, so I'm going to give you what you need, not what you want. Because listen, I'm eternal. You've been here like three seconds. You don't know what you need. I know what you need. And as a loving father, I'm going to shape and chisel and chip and I'm going to at times allow suffering into your world so that you will see that you are not God and I am. And you might shake your fist at me and you might not understand, but I will hold you and cling to you while you cry and wail and accuse me of being wicked so that you might live rather than die. He is our perfecter. Listen to me, every high and every low in your life, if you are a Christian, if you're not a Christian and you're sitting here kind of checking stuff out, I, th this isn't true for you. See, um, although God is the creator of all, he is only the father of some. You tracking with me? He is the creator of all, but he is only the father of some. So if you are a Christian, those high points, those low points in your life are about a holy God chiseling and shaping and molding in a way that a lot of times we can't fathom. You know what helped me understand this? Having kids. Having kids, I've had to um, hold one of my kids down while they had a boil lanced off of their shin, screaming, kicking, and I'm having to restrain her by putting my forearm into her chest and leaning down while the doctor lanced her. I hate you, get off me, I hate you. All she knew is she didn't want to get cut. She didn't know by cutting it we were actually saving her leg. The harder days of my life, 
have been some of the sweeter. And I'm not telling you I liked them. I'm not like, hey, brain cancer's awesome, God, thank you. Please don't hear, I'm not spirit sprinkling any of this. I'm telling you, it was awful and it was awesome. And there's sometimes I miss the precipice. There's sometimes I miss that pressure of eternity that it's right there. So you can follow the people of God in the Bible. They don't do well when everything goes the way they want it. They tend to forget about God. Now let, let's finish our text here. He, he says then, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Now th this idea of the joy set before him was always confusing to me. Uh, like I'd read, uh, I'd read the story of the crucifixion. I'd read how all his crew bailed on him. I'd read how they pulled the skin off of his back, how they mocked him spit on him, pulled the beard out of his face, blindfolded him and struck him and asked him to prophesy who hit. I'd read what happens in crucifixion where they nail you and your lungs begin to fill with blood and the only way to breathe would be to push up on the nail that had been driven through your feet in order to gasp only to fall down and that ultimately you drowned in your own blood before they run that spear through your um, internal organs. And, and so I'd read, and I'm going, where's the joy set before him? And it wasn't until I was preaching through the book of Galatians that, that something jumped out that helped me and I want to really push on you in this way, and then we'll see what the Holy Spirit wants to do here. In Galatians 1, starting in verse 15, the Apostle Paul, who was Saul of Tarsus, so the only thing that we could actually do categorically with Saul of Tarsus is, is that if you want to think of Saul correctly in a historic sense, you need to think of him like a, a general in ISIS. All right, Saul of Tarsus was a leading religious fanatic that was responsible for the murder and slaughter and execution of men, women, and children for the sole reason that they were Christians. So that's Saul of Tarsus, and if you know his conversion story, it's significant. But here's what he says about the day he was converted in Galatians 1, 15 through 16. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace, listen to this, listen to 16, was pleased to reveal his son to me. Now, I, I just want to stop there. That it pleased the father to reveal the son to Saul of Tarsus. If there was any brother in the history of the world that Jesus should have been excited about lighting up, it was Saul of Tarsus. And yet... It pleased God's heart to reveal Jesus to Saul of Tarsus that made him the Apostle Paul that's responsible for the bulk of the New Testament and is the greatest missionary our faith has ever known. Do you believe that? Do you believe that it pleased the Father to reveal the Son to you? See, here, here's what I found. I think most of us don't really have a problem with forgiveness. We kind of get forgiveness. Yeah, God forgives me, died on the cross. I, I get that. I think we struggle a lot with the idea that He likes us. And if we can even imagine that He likes us, He likes some future version of us, not the us right now. He likes super us 10 years from now who wakes up without an alarm and goes right into a two-hour quiet time. And then just walks about in Shekinah glory. We don't even pray for people anymore. Like, you're not sick anymore. You're healed. You just got saved. You right there, submit. Give your life to Christ. You, what was that, Jesus? Okay, yeah, I'm on it. Hey, stop. Right, right? We just think that that's the version of us that Jesus loves. See, here's what's confusing about it. Have you not read the Gospels at all? Does that, is that who he hangs out with? Or does Jesus excel at entering the mess of people's lives? Zacchaeus, get out of the tree, man. Let's go eat at your house. Zacchaeus' life was messy. Does he look for perfection before he lavishes love upon? No, he is perfection. He didn't have to look for it. He is it. He grants it, gives that perfection, imputes that perfection to others. So my plea, just as my time is up, just to try to encourage you, is that wherever you are in your relationship with Christ, don't drift away from the gospel, the simple, beautiful gospel that God is for you, not against you, and that's true today. And that I want to encourage you in this way, quit pretending to be more than you are. How exhausting is that? Just stop it. It's God belittling if God said, I've come for the broken, I've come for the sick, I've come to lavish mercy upon those who would cry out for it, to play this veneer game where you feel like you've got to have it all together. You don't have it all together. That's the point. 
So stop pretending. You need to have real friends where you're really honest. You need to be plugged into a local congregation because this, as awesome as it is, is not the plan of God for you. He wants you right in the middle of a messy, goofy, not perfect congregation, and you'll love that because you'll feel right at home there. Like this, what we're saying and shame me, this ain't church. This might encourage you, but it's not God's plan to disciple you. God's plan to grow you, mature you, involves far less spectacular things. Steadfast, day in, day out, commitment to a body of believers that's serious about growing in Jesus Christ. Not a group of friends hanging out in the dorm talking about Jesus. That's great. But if you always get to choose, and you're not forced to walk with awkward people, man, that's not what God, how do you think God sanctifies and chisels you? By making you walk with other Christians. Anybody here want to just be straight and go, there are Christians uh, that, I, that are around me and they, they bother me. I don't really like them. Anybody want to admit that? I, after that gospel, you, you don't even want to admit that even now. You're like, nah, I love them all. So one of the things local congregations do is, one, they ask you to serve. They, they ask you to give of yourself. That's a part of sanctification. It's part of understanding the gospel. And then they root you in a world that's not all flashbangs and lights and, you know, uber talented people around you all the time. And it's in that beautiful space that the Holy Spirit will shape and mold and move you forward. Neglect her, the church. You neglect only your own maturation in Christ. And Jesus loves you. He'll do it the hard way if you'd like. But I'm a brother reads in the Bible like, easy way, please, easy way. You know, the, the proud, he'll knock off the pedestal. I ain't getting on that pedestal. You don't have to knock me down. I ain't getting up there. I'll just stay away from it. You're so awesome. I'm really not. If you had any, I'm not. I'm really a mess. Why don't you bow your heads and close your eyes. Let me pray for us. Just as I close us out, if you're in here and you would say, um, Pastor Ted, here's the thing, I don't know you, you don't know me, we're not hanging out after this probably. Um, I know a couple of you are members of the village, I'll see you when you come home, but um, if you're here and you're like, Chandler, if I'm, if I'm honest, man, I'm living the veneer, man, I'm wrestling with doubt, I'm struggling with lust, I've got real issues here, I've got a whole secret life here that most people don't know, so I'm playing two parts, I'm totally pretending to be okay when I'm not, I'm struggling my faith, I'm banged up. I'm lonely, I'm frustrated, I'm confused, I'm wrestling with depression, I've got a real fight with lust on my hands. If that's you, would you just raise your hand and go, I'm tired of living the veneer. Would you raise, I'm tired of living this, I'm tired of pretending, I don't want to pretend anymore. Go ahead and get them up high, you shouldn't be ashamed of this. This is what Christ came for. Okay. All right, when you put your hands down, let me pray. Father, thank you for these men and women. Pray that in um, the hours to come that they might find that safe place to confess that, hey, man, I've got some real inconsistencies in my life, and I know that Jesus loves me and his grace is unchanged, but I'm deeply desperate to see God do this work in my life. Help me understand that he is for me and that he loves me and that his grace is sufficient for me. And I pray for, as Luther said, an ongoing ethic of confession and repentance to mark the lives of these young men and women, and pray that would make all the difference in their lives. I pray for salvation against a lifetime of false, veneer, Christian faith that has no love for you, no zeal for your name, no passion for your glory, and in all said and done, a vain attempt at morality that in the end is bankrupt in kingdom economics. Help us, Holy Ghost, we need you. It's for your beautiful name. Amen. Love you guys. Thank you.